Yeah. Ian Blackwood Talk Smack Podcast. Ian Stanger. Ian Blackwood. It's Ian Squared. Here we are. It's, <laughs> been doing this for a while. I feel like I say that a lot. Like it's, I guess because Ian is a rarity. When you see yeah. an Ian, it's like, oh, I better take advantage of the bad dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Stanger. Ian is uh, a musician. I'm not going to say retired because he's not retired. Semi retired. He's, no. he's actually come out of uh, retirement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Singer songwriter. Um, he's also a uh, record label worker and uh, manager of the artists, manager of many artists, uh, works at Black Box Records in Canada. Ian, um, you guys, man, you guys have been doing the label. We were just kind of talking about that. You've been doing yeah. it for quite some time now. Tell us how long you've been, you guys have been cracking away at it for what, almost 15 Ooh. years or so, eh? 2004 Whew. is when Black Box Recording started. Amazing. Um, as you know, we started to put out the Full Blast record yep. um, in, uh, in 2004 and, you know, got our first distro deal through Sonic Onion at the time and, uh, you know, really sort of started once we put out the Full Blast record and we sort of got, we thought we had the hang of what we were doing, we started to work with other local artists and really had a bit of a, like a pay it forward type mentality where, you know, we'd put out one record and if it was successful enough, then we'd pass the baton to the next artist and try to do that one at a time. So, um been doing that all for 15 years now and you know the the business has really sort of taken a lot of like turns in uh, in that period of time both generally and at an hour specifically but right. um we're still here and like i was saying to you earlier i'm been doing this for almost 15 years and i'm like as excited or more excited now um than i ever have been and it's not often you get to say that no it's got to feel amazing to, to to be doing this thing for what a decade and a half arguably and you're getting this sort of fresh kick. It's got to feel good, right? Yeah, That's yeah, amazing. 100%. I mean, it's just like, like I said, things have sort of shifted and changed and the the, the roster is sort of, um, you know, over the last 15 years, it's turned over a couple times. You yeah. Know? Um, and you guys, but, have, you, you guys ex- have expanded styles, I find too, right? You kind of started as- Yeah, a, I would say- You kind of had to, I guess, right? To, yeah, to and around a, 2006 or so, we, Jason and, and I sort of like came to this, realization that we didn't want to be like we started as a primarily like punk and hardcore underground indie type of record label yeah and that's where our roots always will be and that's totally. what i grew up doing and <clears throat> but we realized that at some point we needed to branch out a little bit and that our musical tastes really um you know were, were more diverse than what the what the label was about at that moment mm-hmm. so that's when we started looking at different different genres and since then it's been rock pop hip-hop singer songwriter um you know metal indie lo-fi whatever it is yeah. it's like it's been all over the map for over the over the years so we're excited to just like we put out in my in my opinion you know i think we, we just we, we put out good records it doesn't matter what the genre is right. we try to find artists that we believe in yeah and i think that's been borne out you know as much as we don't we know we never really try to put the label ahead of the artist yeah in terms of like putting our our brand in front of anybody but i was sort of thinking back on it we were at the juno awards last weekend for the glorious sons were nominated congratulations and by the way you thank guys. you they, they won yep. so that's yeah it was exciting. fantastic um but we're thinking about it you know we've been over the years we've been nominated in the rap category mm-hmm. in the rock category in the folk category um you know there's a number of other ones as well but it's just like the idea that we could be we could find artists that sort of break through in each of these genres um is a testament to the artist. Yeah. Um, but also sort of shows that we, you know, we appreciate a diverse sort of cross section of music. I think it's cool because you guys, you, you started off, like you said, you know, it was back in the day and in, in the full blast and you, you kind of needed a home. You needed to put, you needed, to, you wanted to put out a record and then it's this organic style, but then all of a sudden it just blossoms into this, like this new machine, this new beast. And it's like, it's so cool, man. You guys, cause like you said, it's very colorful. It's not, it's, it's, you know, it's not just rap. It's not just rock. It's not just, like, you guys have everything. You got a little bit of everything. And yeah. It's, that's super cool, man. Super yeah. Cool. I mean, it's, it's credit to all of our artists, man. That's, that's what it is. I mean, we do what we can to, uh, to try and help and support and foster and, you know, whatever we can do to try to help. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sure. But um, when it does, it goes well and we're, we're, we're riding something right now, which we're excited about. Do you find, um, inter- like artists that you work with, maybe fresh artists at the gate. I mean, there's always that sort of, um, infancy, right. And in, in sort of, uh, you know, like that, uh, 
they're new and they're fresh and they don't really know kind of the industry. Do you find that sometimes like um, it can be a bit of a mission to like, like, is it, is it tough to like kind of like let certain, not I don't want to say let artists down, but you know, sometimes there's that moment where um, no matter what you're doing, sometimes mm. It's just not. Sometimes things just yeah. don't really line it's, up, right? And yeah, it's that's a tough you, thing, right? It's part totally. of what you guys have to deal with being management, being a label. Yeah, and the the, the relationships with each artist is different. Sure. And I think it's and and we don't manage everybody that we work with, right? And uh, um, but it's yeah, it's I mean it's difficult. I think I tried to learn years ago, and it's something I have to sort of remind myself of every now and then. But I tried to. Tried to, you know, remind my remind myself years ago, like try to not take anything personally in this business. You know, right? And yeah, it's tough because it's like music is creativity and music absolutely. is subjective. And, and you yourself, you're an artist too, so yeah. you you have a yeah. you have a different um, feeling towards it. I think in that you know you're totally. in it, but you're also you understand. I understand some people it don't, because because right? for like for these artists, like it's 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 their thing. Mm -hmm. It's the in many ways it's the it's the only thing they have or the only thing they care about. Sure. It's their number one priority in life. And for us, you know, we've put just by nature of the business and what we have to be doing, there's, you know, two, three, four, five priorities at any given time. So I can see, like, I could, like, from an artistic point of view, um, you know, I sympathize with artists, you know, because you, you want somebody that's got that same vision. And we, we, we do our best to align with that vision mm -hmm. uh, as often as possible. Um, but yeah, there's times where it doesn't work out and that's, you know, it's disappointing because you don't want to disappoint of course, yeah. these people who they've, you know, they've entrusted you with, you know, their dreams or with their aspirations and with their, you know, with their career. Um, and, you know, for any number of reasons, it's just like when it works, it works for not for one reason, but for a number of reasons. The same way that when it doesn't work, it works out for a number of reasons, not just one. A recurring theme I find in the music industry and in a lot of the entertainment industries too. You look at films, films are made and then, yeah. you know, sometimes even commercials are shot for companies they don't even use them. So. Yeah. It happens, man. Well, okay, I want to talk, I want to switch gears a little bit because, um, I mean, not too much. We're, we're staying in the music zone, but I want to talk the full blast reunion because I think this is so cool and so wild. You guys decided, all right, let's, you know, dust off the, like dust yeah. off the cobwebs <laughs> yep. and give this thing another go. What was it like? Um, I mean, and essentially it was with all the same guys really in the, in, near the end, right? It was with Darren and yeah, it's Andy, Brian, and yourself. The, and yeah. Same the four, four right? of us. Yeah. Ian is me. <laughs> that is Andy, <laughs> uh, Brian and Darren. And yeah. like, we were the four guys that were essentially core to the band, um, during like the, the latter years or right. whatever. And, you know, we had founding members and Ray and Cordy that, you know, had a huge impact on the alumni right? yeah on the, on the direction of where we went creatively and yeah. contributing to, to early records and stuff um but yeah it was like the last two or three years of the band was was the four of us and right. you know a rotating fifth member present company included <laughs> <laughs> guilty as charged yeah. <laughs> um yeah and so we just sort of you know the band ended in a weird way 2006 um and you left the band none of us were happy about it. Right. Um, and so we sort of, should we talk about that? We don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not like we all haven't, haven't talked about it. Um, but yeah, so it, it was, it was a tough time because it was something we all had, you know, really invested ourselves in. And, Absolutely. Um, to have that sort of that moment. Um, we felt like we were sort of on the verge of something. And then, you know, like I said, it's the breakup of the band wasn't Andy's fault. Sure. Um, like I said, if, if things go wrong, it's not for one reason, it's for many reasons. Of course. Um, but that was, you know, that sort of, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for the band, really. So, um, yeah, it was like, we did some reunion shows over the years, you know, never really intended to like, to keep going back to the well that way. Mm. Um, but these just, these opportunities kept sort of falling in our lap to do something interesting. So, you know, we did a reunion final show, final show in 2008 at the Opera House, um, because a Wilhelm scream was on tour there and Brian plays in a Wilhelm scream and it was just, which like, was a fantastic show. Cause it was incredible. You we also had, included all your friends, including me, including all the, the other, band I was playing at the time and I got to play with you guys yeah, and all it was, the, it was a big party at the opera house. Yeah. All amazing. the, all the, all the band guys were back and our friends and family for the most part were there. It gave everybody who like didn't have a chance to say goodbye to the band one last try to, to sort of do that. And so, you know, a couple of years went by and then we were offered an opportunity to play in Guelph with Grade and Monine and Grade is 
you know. Yeah, you, you, on don't, the, you don't have to Russian say no to that. Yeah. yeah, of course. Um, and so it's like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And then a couple of years later, um, Burley Calling is like, mm. you know, we, we really think that this would be a great fit. And we're like, okay, let's do it again. Like, you know, every couple of years, just having, doing it for fun. And then at the end of that one, um, we sort of agreed that if we were going to do it again, we need, we wanted to have new music. And that sort mm. of set a bit of a, we set a bit of a, a goal for ourselves. Yeah. If, if we were going to keep coming back and trying to do this thing, we would actually have some new music to share with people. So the rumble so, romance kind of slid back in a little bit and you said, all right. Uh, yes and no. I would oh, okay. say it did, but like, it was also sort of like a, a sort of creating a little bit of a, a barrier that we, that we had to, Okay. Like that we had to cross sure. in order to do it again. Okay. Know? Okay. We didn't want it to just be easy and keep going back to doing the same Which thing. Which I think that's over. really cool. It's very admirable yeah. in the fact that you guys decided, okay, let's, you know, screw it. Like, fuck it. We've, it's been a challenge before. Let's, fuck, why don't we just make it a little bit yeah. of an extra? Yeah. And so then that, like, you know, in typical full blast fashion, like fell off the table within a couple of weeks. Of us. <laughs> and so um, the real catalyst for us writing new music was, um, was Andy moving back uh, to the suburbs uh, and and Darren moving to the suburbs? Andy was and, living. He was living out west, right? Yeah, yeah. He was move, he's living out west, and then he moved back to In Oakville, Columbia, and yeah. then um, Darren moved uh, pretty close uh, close to him. And mm. all of a sudden, they were you know a five ten minute car ride from one another, and those guys are inseparable. <laughs> you know, even when there is distance between them. So yeah. all of a sudden, um, you know, they're they're sitting down on. And you know, on a ra- on a random Tuesday night, just yeah. sort of writing riffs and hey, you know that the thing Raptors. I had yeah. in the yeah, yeah yeah. So all of a sudden, <laughs> that like that proximity created this opportunity for them to go and write some interesting stuff, and nice. you know they started sending some stuff around to to the to Brian myself, and um, you know it went from like you know oh that would be fun to like oh this could actually be a a thing a thing yeah um, which has got to be a cool feeling right even. At that moment, going like kind of like that that light bulb moment of oh, it's not just like a, it's not just a Mickey Mouse thing. Like it's like I don't know, it's just an after Saturday afternoon cartoon. It's like oh, wait a minute, there's yeah, a little, maybe there's a little spark here. And maybe, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. And cool. then you know, I always like we all agreed that we didn't want to do it again if we weren't going to be as good as before. You know, like if right. we didn't feel like the recordings were going to be as like or the songs are going to be as good as they were before, and you know. Full disclosure: We never really made a record that we love the sound of. That's so. a, yeah, and that that has been a recurring theme with all of you guys. I've talked to Darren about it too before, and Andy, and yeah, yeah that seems to be sort of a general so we're like, consensus. okay, if we're gonna write some songs, let's go record them really well, and let's like have something we can be really excited about, whether anybody else cares or not. Nothing at wrong this with point, that, man. In, two, in two thousand, at that point, two thousand sixteen. Yeah. Who who cares? Yeah. So uh, that's what we did, and we wrote an EP, uh, five songs, recorded it with Derek Kaufman in Toronto back in October of twenty sixteen, put it out early last year and crushed Spotify's like punk list and <laughs> Canada punk yeah. and all this like it was so cool man it was like this it got re-energized it was so cool to see it yeah. like it was, it was funny because you had like you had people that had been following this band for like almost 20 years right. um, who were excited about it and you had people coming to the world work that had, like this band had not been active for 10 years they'd never heard of us before but maybe finding us on skate park punks or you know some of these different playlists right. um and discovering this band and the fun thing about that i would imagine is that if you find this new track that you're really excited about and all of a sudden you realize that there's two albums worth of <laughs> stuff to go and dive into that could be interesting that's so, true yeah like, yeah, yeah like yeah that's actually really great I didn't even think of it that way because you might even get some you know I'm sure you get a lot of new listeners or even listeners that maybe had kind of heard the, the name but I have no metrics on that but I'd be very surprised I've if done it, it. I mean, like I think, yeah we've all done it right you you get a you get one album by a band you like and then all of a sudden you know it's like you get forever and counting and then you go or you get no division and then you go forever and counting and then yeah. you feel the hate game and you're like whoa hot water music oh my god yeah it's hot water music by the way for all the non <laughs> I don't know, punk nerds. I always wonder if they're actually a punk band. How Water Music? Yeah. 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 I wonder if they think they're a punk band. I think so. Yeah. I think Chris Willard for sure, because I mean, he always, I've always found struck like, me as like the, the most ge- punk rock dude in the band. Yeah. I've always found the geography of punk rock to be pretty interesting. You know, like when people ask about like what the Full Blast was, like what our influences were, um, you get all kinds of different sort of uh, opinions about it, but you've mm. got, you know, West Coast punk that's you know, the fat wreck sort of no use for a name, lag wagon, no yeah. effect stuff. And you have like East coast punk, which is more sort of hardcore tinged and like lifetime kid dynamite, you know, that sort of Jade tree kind of scene. And you've got the Florida scene with against me and hot water music and yeah. these sort of like more, um, gruff, like sort of garage sort of mid beat kind yeah. of, you know, 
What like org core? I think people call it. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. And I just feel like you know that you can really. Uh, there was a time. I'm not sure how much of it is the same these days, but there was a time where you could really sort of get a regional flavor on on some stuff. Yeah, I think Burlington had that too. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so the, the, the you guys get back together and you're writing a record, and it, it did it feel same feel different or did it just feel fresh and new and uh, you're older now you're no, in your thirties I think it and felt. Uh, I don't honestly. I don't. I don't know if I can sort of compare it to the sure. way it was before. Yeah. Um, it the process was very similar in that you know Andy and Darren wrote a lot of the the music. Yep. Um, the three of us would get together and work on sort of structure and, mm-hmm. and and arrangements and stuff. And did Derek have a bit of say, like as a producer, was he kind of here and there uh, a little bit? And... Yeah, I mean, he did a lot. Uh, he did more so with the vocals, mm. I would say. I was that was my yeah that was sort of my assumption. My yeah, next question the, was the. Like the the first layer was Andy and Darren. The second layer was adding me with some um, like st- structural arrangement ideas. Uh, third layer was was Bry coming mm. in. And um, for those of you that don't know what Bry is about, he's a phenomenal bass player. Oh my goodness! Um, and Guys, you're never sure what he's going to pull out of his bag yeah, of tricks. That's totally. the thing. So all of a sudden, you you know we, these songs we've been living with for a couple of weeks or a couple of months without bass, all of a sudden have something ridiculous put over top of that. And that was exciting. Which is always so cool. It's like all of a sudden, whoa. Yeah. Oh, he's doing that now. Like, And the yeah. problem for me was I don't write vocal melodies right. until I, until the bass is on Okay, there. okay. So like- Which might be a good thing because you might've wasted your time. Well, <laughs> yeah. So like, but the, the, the crazy thing was like, you know, the, the guys were writing, uh, or the, sorry, the guys were in the studio recording and I was still like feverishly trying to finish- lyrics basically lyrics like melody was basically there but trying to trying to finish lyrics yeah um that came together relatively quickly but it was last minute in a way and that's why i think derek had more of a say in the vocal production and 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 sort of having an input on that um because those ones were those ideas were a little more malleable sure by the time we got into the studio Mm. um we really you know the guys are good players really good players and we take pride on going in there and like being professional band prepared and so you know there wasn't a whole lot to change about what andy or darren were doing with drums and guitar um bass nobody's gonna tell bry how (laughs) how to play the bass i don't think (laughs) um other than maybe to lay back every now and then right right um but vocals you know derek has a really phenomenal pop sensibility and i you know I came in with what I thought were some great melodies, great lyrics, and he was able to sort of help me just amplify that a little bit. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, and Derek's great. I mean, it's cool to get a young, sort of a young vibe from it, right? I mean, yeah. it's always nice. He's such a, he's got such a great, you know, um, he's got a colorful sort of style. Like, I like it. He can he can pluck from this and pluck Well, we just like, and... we didn't want to make the same record um, again. Right. And we right. didn't want to make the same record the same way right. again. So going to a, a guy who, um, you know, I've known for a number of years, we've worked together mm. before on, on a production side, on his artist side. Um, he, he has like a, a really sort of um, contemporary sort of perspective on things. Yep. And then he also like from like both from a songwriting and like what's currently like sonically right now, what's working. Um, um, but also from a production perspective. So like yeah. people are like, oh, I love the guitar tones on the record or like, it's a Kemper. Like that's like, like we, like we are using 2018 or 2017 technology, yep. Yep. 2016 at that time, I guess. Um, but a guy like Derek would love that because that's, that's what he's doing now. That's, yeah. That's, and I think the guys his... were liberated by it. You know, it's sure. just like, you don't come in with your Marshall 800 and cap as phenomenal as that's going to sound. <laughs> sure. Or Darren with his fucking high watt. Yeah. Um, like <laughs> he fucking find, loves that. Yeah, but we can find that and we can find yeah. sounds that really blend together well and totally. that like complement everything we're trying to do. And I think that's, um, that, that versatility was, was exciting. And I think we got a record that we're all re- still excited to listen to. Oh, it sounds fantastic. And it's funny because we, we go back talking about amps, we talk about it all day and the, you know, you come from the, the scene we came from and the, the, the marshals and the, and the messes and the, you know, the high Watts, but it's like, it's great to see, some fresh new tech you just plug into a little box and all of a sudden the thing sounds just See, well, as I've good if this, not better i don't know i've got this like this <laughs> this opinion about about bands and how you sort of like you sort of start playing out of your like little combo amp yes. and getting a drive to the show in your monster cell yep and then eventually you work your way up to like full stacks in a trailer yep. with a 15 passenger van and everybody has more gear than they need. <laughs> yeah. Five drum kids at a show. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the full boss is going to play at the bovine next week. And we're trying to figure out how to pair it, like how to not bring any gear with yep. us right now. Yeah. So yep. you sort of go like up, 
and then you come back down yeah. again where you want to be playing on combos and sharing gear and <laughs> yeah that's interesting it, it comes full like, circle <laughs> as like yeah like as a 17 year old used to sharing gear and yeah. like crap gear and, a, yeah. and like even you, distortion pedals yeah when you turn 35 you're back to being a 17 year old you're just like I'll use whatever <laughs> gear is there I don't want to carry it I totally yeah so. Well, I want to talk, okay, South America, like yeah. face-to-face. Yeah. Talk about, that's that's a dream come true for, well, yeah, for a lot so of people. That was huge. If you want to talk about Spotify um, and, the, the, and, and Apple Music and the way that that sort of, um, that support like impacted us moving forward, um, you'd look no further than South America. And it's basically <laughs> it's like, huge. you know, they, there's a promoter in South America. He came to us, basically said, listen, I've been, I loved your band for like 15 years. I want to bring you back on tour here. Um, do you have any like metrics or proof that sort of shows that you've got an audience here? Cause I, I think you do, right. but I don't know for sure that you do. And so we went and checked and, you know, our Facebook was like in like huge numbers from South America and Spotify. They love punk rock. And Spotify numbers were huge numbers they in South America. fast punk rock. Yeah. And so I went back to him and was like, actually, here's the... Here's the here's the data. Here's the um, here's the data. Actually, <laughs> yeah, and uh, which is wild that you could do that now because this was this was two thousand one, so right? So <laughs> like, let me tell you, like when we were down there on so so anyway. So long story short, he looks at the data. He's like, "Cool, I'm gonna go present it to the agent." Comes back to us. He's like, "Do you guys want to go on tour with face to face in South America?" Oh uh, yeah. And we're all like, honestly, like I th- I wasn't sure that Darren was gonna be able to do it. Right, our guitar player because he's oh so you mean okay so you so inside you say yes, but then you go yes. Oh hold on, I'm thirty something. Yeah, we, reality he, yes. reality kicks in. Yeah, and, and we've got you know guitar player who's the vice president of a company with two kids and like, you know, three of us carrying mortgages and tell his 16 year old self. Yeah. That, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Darren was the first one to reply back saying, fuck yes. I'm like, nah, I'm, so I'm the nice. first one in. <laughs> nice. um, but anyway, while we were in South America, the promoter was telling us that, you know, if we had come down and toured on our own in 2004, 2005, while the band was like at its most active. Yeah. Um, he's like, we'd probably be playing for a thousand to 2000 kids a night on our own. But in, 2004, 2005, there wasn't any, like, there was no way to know that, you know, there was no. That's true. That is a fact. (laughs) So you'd have to basically, like, somebody like him would have to call you and say, trust me, (laughs) like, get your shit together. I feel like we did that a lot. Yeah. Trust me. And then it's easier to say, trust me. And then drive to like Uxbridge. than It is to say, trust me. And then fly to South America. Yeah. So Brazil. uh, Okay. We're here now. Rio de Janeiro. Hey, we're here. (laughs) Yeah. So I wonder if a show's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was sort of, that was the thing. So we went on tour with face to face and ignite and much (laughs) the same from Chicago and a band called the decline from Perth, Australia. Nice. And it was 10 grueling, Oh. days of like once in a lifetime kind of experience. Yeah. And how were the shows? Were they just some of the them- shows were really, really, really good. Yeah. yeah. Like, bet. um, the biggest one was Sao Paulo and that was shout out to Sao Paulo then. Yeah. Yeah. So much fun. Um, that one was like maybe 900 people. Wow. Nice. And then the smallest one was in Lima, Peru, which was like just under 200 mm-hmm. and like this like community center kind of vibe. Like yep. it sort of felt like, um, the Polish hall a little bit, mm-hmm. same sort of idea. Um, with like a built-in stage or whatever. And um, yeah, it was, I mean. Never too big for your britches. No. Remember that. <laughs> no, it was great. I mean, like, how many people can say they went to South America, especially well, with face-to-face and Ignite and have yeah, such and a Yeah, and the time. idea of being like somewhere you've never been before, so far from home. Like yeah. I looked at, when we were in Buenos Aires, I looked at a map. I'm like, holy shit. Like this is, yeah. like we are a long way from home right now. It's, it's, yeah, it's, um, here you are. And kids singing your lyrics back at you. You know, for songs, that, for songs he wrote 15 years ago. Like, it's nuts. See, that that to me is wild. Like, yeah. that's the the power of music, right? Man. Yeah. I it was a, It was an interesting feeling for sure. Like, a bit, like, something that in the moment, I don't know that I took the time to appreciate, but after right. the fact, when everybody was asking about the tour and how it was and everything, I started to reflect on it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that was, like, that's powerful to think that you've, you know, we played eight shows, eight shows? Yeah, eight shows. Um, and there was a, at least a small handful at every show that were, that were singing along and uh, oftentimes more than that. So, you know, it was, uh, like I said, once in a lifetime experience. And what a feeling, man, to get to, to get to feel it again yeah. and to get to, you know, like that's, do you ever feel that with, uh, some of the artists that you're, you're you know, you guys have, um, released albums for you're managing, do you ever get that feeling off side stage? You're kind of watching an artist. Oh ever? yeah. hundred percent. So like, it must've been nice to, in a sense, kind of get back into those shoes yourself and just kind of go, ah, yeah, man. totally. Like that's cool. Uh, the glorious sounds that band that we were talking about earlier. Mm. Um, 
they sold out the K Rock Center in Kingston, <sighs> which is like their hometown arena, six thousand people. Um, two nights before, Incredible. they played at the the Merchant Tap House, which is like the the small bar they used to play at growing up. Oh, uh, juxtapose that, huh? Yeah. So we <laughs> played. So Thursday night they played for two hundred people. Um, you know, it was rammed, obviously, yeah, of course. uh, turned people away, unfortunately, yeah, but, uh, and then two days later they were like down the, like literally two blocks over at the K-Rock Center playing for 6,000. And, and then from there, there was a Saturday night, uh, Sunday morning, woke up, took a, uh, a bus to the airport and then flew to Berlin and we're playing for a hundred people on Monday night. So it's just like the ebbs and flows yep. of, we've talked about that, yeah. that. Yeah. And I think that that, so like, you know, watching that band do what they do. Uh, or what they've done in the last, you know, the last two years. That's like from a business perspective and from the, like the, the, you know, the, 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 the business side of, of the music industry. That's like, that was interesting to watch. And then to be able to feel that again last October with full blast stuff was like, man. put me right back in there and, and it made Good me appreciate you. what they must be feeling too. You know? Yeah, sure, man. I mean, the, uh, you go to Berlin and play for a hundred people. It, it, that alone is amazing anyway. But the fact that you just played K-Rock for like, 6,000 plus. It's just like, oh yeah, I remember when we did that. Like you get to, yeah. I remember when we did that. That was two days ago. <laughs> like like we probably haven't slept actually since yeah. we played that. Show. <laughs> remember we did it? Yeah, I haven't slept yet. Yeah. yeah. Amazing, man. Well, so. um, I'll do a final segment here. I'm just gonna, I do this thing called the shit I'm into. Yeah. Um, very simple. Uh, for the uh, listeners and viewers out there, what I'm into today, sometimes it's a book, sometimes it's a video game console. Usually when it is, it's only a Nintendo. It doesn't go higher than a Super Nintendo because I'm green when it comes to anything that you mm -hmm. wear a headset and like hook up to the internet. But uh, I'm into Spotify right now. I'm, I'm into the monthly subscription. I'm finding it, like I actually left Apple Music. Sorry, Apple. But... Uh, I've got both Apple. Just, just <laughs> He's fine. He's both. safe. <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna get zapped or something. But maybe this old '70s uh, mixer is gonna zap. Yeah. Me. But yeah, I'm 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 just really into uh, Spotify right now. I just I love how easy it is to access music. And I mean, Apple was fine. It's just I we did I will say we got a Google Home, mm -hmm. and it only works off Google Play or Spotify. So. There you go. So that's the shit I'm into. Ian, what are you into? What am I into? I mean, I'll be honest. Right now, I'm sort of spending a bunch of my downtime playing video games. It's just a nice little escape. Cool. Um, what so, are you playing on? What's like... Well, I'm in a transitional Call of Duty period. or something? No, or? no, no. I'm, it's always sports these days. Okay. Like, I don't have enough time to just, like... Ian's a, to, to, Ian's a quarterback, by the way. He's a high school quarterback. Yeah, I don't, I don't have time to, like, to, to lose myself in those RPGs anymore. Although Red Dead Redemption 2 is coming out next fall, and I'm probably... Don't know, this a, sounds awesome, I'm gonna, oh, you're, it's like It's like Buck Hunter, but, like, in real life. Oh, okay, that's the best thing ever, it's then. GTA, it's... but on horseback with a rifle. <laughs> Amazing, okay. Um, Love it. So I'm mean, probably going to book a week off work and just do that. Um, nice. But it's NBA 2K18, because the NBA is coming close to the playoffs and MLB the show 18 because baseball season is just kicking off. Oh, so yeah. those are my two things. How about the that, Blue Jays, huh? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. It's a good start so far. Yeah? But yeah. Good. Um, and then, I mean, the, the other thing too is is podcasts. I mean, this is fun that we're doing this because I, you know, um, working music is fun yep. and I like to listen to music as often as I can, but there's also times when I don't want to be listening to music. Right. I'd like to sort of take myself out of that a little bit. And uh, podcasts are... Uh, are like a, a, you know, a big sort of piece of my commute on a regular basis now. So, um, you know, political stuff like, um, pod save America or, you know, fantasy sports stuff that I listen to just like, I, my favorite part about podcast is that you can really find that special niche that really yeah. excites you and, nice. uh, and sort of lose yourself in it. So. Like the Ian Blackwood Talk Smack podcast. Like the Ian Blackwood Talk Smack <laughs> podcast. Almost hard to say. Subscribe. Yeah. Yes. Well, Ian Stanger, thanks so much. Um, Black Box Records, Black Box Management too. Mm -hmm. um, full blast. Um, just uh, quick before we go, uh, socials, you want to plug anything for everyone so they know where to go uh, and how to get there? And... Sure. Give us a follow at, at We Are Black Box on pretty much all those platforms. Nice. Ian and and uh, the Full Blast RIP. There you go. On all those platforms. It's sad and slightly dark. Uh, BBR Black Box Records. Ian Stanger, thanks so much for coming on, man. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me, man. It's great. Awesome. Smack, smack. Ian Blackwood talks smack.